Um, I'm going to hand over to Adina now, who's going to introduce our speakers. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Okay, uh, we're live now. Okay, um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third installment um, of After All Art School. Um, After All Art School is a new project uh, developed between we're After live. All okay. um, everybody. Fine Art Department at uh, St. Martins and Maspi in Sao Paulo. I think there's, there's some background noise. Oh, that's sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, after all, is a, so it's a project uh, to reflect on, uh, on issues uh, of art and art pedagogy um, during this, uh, this crisis. Uh, so today we have the, the pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, John Miller, uh, who's going to talk about uh, Mike Kelly's educational complex. Uh, John already wrote a book uh, on this artwork for um, our series, uh, One Work. Um, and um, he's accompanied by uh, by Alex Shady, who's the program director of the of the art de uh, the art department at uh, Central Saint Martin. So, um, yeah, I, the the floor is yours, uh, John and, and Alex. Oh, thank you, Adina. Just a quick note before you start. Um, oh, Alex, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, say, just before we start. Um, Everyone uh, in the audience, please do ask questions all the way through and we will just um, keep a note of them and deliver them after Alex and John have had a chance to talk for about half an hour. Um, and at that point, I'm happy to make anyone visible or audible who wants to be or also happy to keep it anonymous if you prefer. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna hand back to you now. Thank you. I'm off mute now, I can speak. Um, so the first thing was that, John, you and I slightly agreed, perhaps, that you would kick off just with a brief description of the work so that we can sort of put that in context before we start the, the discussion. Is that all right if we start with that? Yeah, yeah, that would be good. And um, uh, just to um, add to what Amber said, um, yes, if any of you have questions, um, I would welcome them because it can help me actually focus my comments. And um, so... Yeah, I generally appreciate uh, questions. So uh, I guess what I'll do first is just talk a little bit about educational complex, which is kind of where uh, my participation in this uh, comes from. So for that, I'm gonna screen share just so you have an image of it. And there it is. And I'll just bring one of these up. Uh, Sorry, new image. Okay, so this is a, a, a close up of the work and uh, what, what the work is physically primarily is a, is a collection of uh, architectural models. And uh, what Mike Kelly did was to um, make architectural models of all the schools he attended, plus his childhood home, which was a, an American suburban style ranch house. You can see the um, a corner of that uh, at the bottom right uh, of this image. And um, it, it's funny because uh, by the time Mike uh, made this work, we knew each other for many years, however, um, I, and I, I went to the opening when he first uh, showed this piece at uh, Metro Pictures and just assumed that I knew what was going on. But in fact, it's, uh, it's quite a challenging work and it wasn't really until um, I was invited to write something about it for After All uh, that I really began to understand uh, what the work is about. Uh, and it, it's an interesting um, kind of project because it splits the difference between autobiography and anonymity. Um, so on the one hand, clearly like the selection of these buildings is driven by a, a kind of autobiographical narrative but one of the claims that Mike Kelly made while producing this work was that he was um, attempting to reproduce the floor plans of all these different buildings from memory. And then the, the parts that he couldn't remember, which uh, later he said were 
just about all of them, um, were he called sites of abuse. And he based that, he drew that idea off of um, a kind of moral panic uh, that was occurring in the United States about 10 years before he made this piece. And um, it centered on uh, one case called the McMartin Preschool case where um, parents of preschool children uh, were unnerved by um, the fact that uh, some young men were caregivers and they assumed that the only reason men would have for taking on a job like this was to abuse children. Uh, and it was also at a time when uh, women were really beginning to enter the workplace in the US uh, as a kind of you know, majority of women. So that was also connected to um, unease about um, feminism and feminist developments in American culture. So um, it started with one parent accused uh, one of the men who worked at this childcare center of sexual abuse. And then it snowballed into where the whole community uh, got up in arms uh, with pretty much no evidence. And the prosecutor in the case uh, relied on this principle that she called uh, repressed memory syndrome. So the prosecution uh, developed this case on the basis that everything that the children said had to be believed, that was taken, you know, had to be taken as absolute truth. And then anything that the children could not remember, and, rem and these are like very young children, like toddlers, anything that they couldn't remember was the result of sexual abuse and repression, repressed memory is the result of sexual abuse. So um, in a way, Mike Kelly was claiming the status of one of these children for himself in this scenario uh, where, um, the work that he did leading up to this particular piece uh, was his arena series, which I think remains his most popular work. And these are works where he arranged um, used stuffed animals uh, around the periphery of usually Afghans that were placed on the floor, directly on the floor. And um, he claimed that uh, some people saw that as evidence of sexual abuse because some of these stuffed animals were tattered and torn. Uh, you know, he got he got them from Goodwill stores and Salvation Army secondhand stores. Um, one of the funny things he did as soon as he got all these stuffed animals, he would throw them in uh, like a big 33-gallon garbage bag. And, and empty an entire can of insecticide and leave it, leave them sealed up for a month because he, you know, he didn't know where these things had been, what what they might carry. Um, but anyway, uh, what 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 he did in making this piece was he was claiming that the audience was projecting this status onto him, so he pretty much took the ball and ran with it. Um, so anyway, that's a kind of overview. I'll, maybe I'll stop the screen share and go back. Um, but, um, oh, here it is. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to add was, I, you know, I, I went back and researched this and I actually found no published criticism of anyone uh, accusing PM or, or, or raising the prospect that he was sexually abused. Uh, there was just one um, uh, aside by the critic David Riminelli, who's um, a, a art critic who generally has a pretty irreverent tone much of the time. And he raised the McMartin preschool case kind of as a compliment, you know, as a sort of black humor. Uh, but that said, um, I remember when I, uh, years ago, I was teaching at the School of Visual Arts and I took my class up to see Mike Kelly's retrospective at the Whitney Museum. And then leaving the museum, several of the students said like, oh, he was sexually abused. And it's the first time I'd heard it when I, when I brought my students to see the show. 
So that was about five or six years after the, the piece had originally been made. And uh, anyway, when I first saw this work, I had no idea that there was a connection between that narrative and the piece. I don't, you know, so a lot of the, I guess what I'm saying is a lot of the work is also textual and it has to do with uh, Mike Kelly attempting to manipulate or, or use his audience or his viewers as a foil. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. And, and you know, uh, what to believe is, <laughs> is your title for the essay. And I think that that is really crucial to our understanding of, of, of this work in a sense, in, in the way it plays with the audience in that it, it either, we either do or don't believe it and whether we do or don't believe it makes a difference. And yes. I guess I wanted to think a little bit more about the, the holes in the work and, and where you place, how you think about the holes in terms of the work itself, but also in terms of a, a sort of contemporary landscape uh, of sort of art school education and what those holes represent. Partly because I was thinking that it's perhaps, you know, important to note that, that the whole is only ever described by the thing that surrounds it. The whole itself is an absence. So it's only ever the framing of it that becomes the thing you see. And, that, and that's very evident in, in the Mike Kelly works, but I think also potentially very evident in, if we think about holes in relation to, to a sort of uh, landscape now of, of art schools and what's happening in the current pandemic. Yeah, yeah, he, he definitely um, uh, looks at like, you know, a whole network of schools as a kind of frame, you know, so in, in that sense, there's a, a real parallel to um, Hans Hacke's best known piece, Soplaski et al, a real time social system where um, is, uh, Hacke was looking at um, not exactly the real estate that any of the museum trustees uh, were um, actually invested in, but he, you know, he documented tenement buildings that uh, were owned by people of the same class. Let's put it that way. So it wasn't it wasn't so direct, even though the Guggenheim censored Haka's show. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, what Mike Kelly was really getting into was a kind of institutional critique that wasn't recognized as such at the time. And um, there was also um, in the 70s, 80s, and even going into the 90s, there was like this dichotomy uh, in the US art world where it was, people tended to talk about um, the market and the museum gallery nexus as being a kind of dirty place and the schools being clean. So Mike Kelly was turning that on its head uh, and um, and then, of course, there you know there was like the reverse criticism that um, uh, people in the museum gallery nexus would characterize uh, academia as being ivory tower and, and disconnected. And um, and it was really I, I think the um, the first person to sort of raise this explicitly in criticism, at least to my knowledge, uh, was Howard Singerman, who uh, was the first uh, really serious critic of Mike Kelly's work. And he, he published a book that was, I believe his PhD thesis called Art Subjects. And he was looking at how um, uh, the subjectivity of artists are you know, to use an Althusserian term, interpolated uh, by uh, graduate schools, in this case, that's what he was focused on in, in trying to like uh, look at the relationship of ideology to institution and to the notion of the artist as an individual subject. And, and, um, and when I came to write about, I, I think, you know, largely through the lens of Howard Singerman's work, when I came to write about Mike's work, um, I really ended up making an argument that was very much strongly based on Louis Althusser's idea of uh, the subject and the, you know, what he called the ideological state apparatus. Um, but also, you also make, you know, um, describe 
a sort of educational environment in the late 70s in CalArc, in which, the, in your words, the school forced its students to face their subjectivity within, within a simulated void, namely one that reduced instruction to the preconditions of identity formation, so that the, the school is there to um, not to provide skill or knowledge, but rather the school is there to allow you to construct yourself as an artist, and that becomes the... the, the yes. Right, right. So it's sort of, um, in a way, you, you could even say that like, um, the approach at CalArts, uh, and for me, it, I, I drew like a really sharp distinction because I, uh, as an undergraduate graduate art student, I attended the Rhode Island School of Design, which uh, was at that time a much more conservative school. And um, I don't think in the Educational Complex book, I... Um, went straight to John Baldessari's uh, teaching technique. But um, since he passed away recently, and since I work closely with him as a student, I've been thinking a lot about the way he taught. And, you know, in, in the kind of, um, in, in contemporary American art education, he's, <laughs> he wasn't only physically a towering figure, but also intellectually a towering figure. And, and I, I think a lot of that, um, came from Zen and, uh, and a, a kind of lineage uh, coming from John Cage through Alan Caprao to Baldessari. And it's interesting that after he passed away, I started reading some short biographies of John and learned that, um, in fact, he had studied religion before deciding to become an artist. Um, but he never gave up, he never gave a religious spin uh, to his teaching. It was very, it was very blank. It was very hands off. And, um, and yeah, it was pretty much, uh, people learned pretty quickly that CalArts was like putting the ball in the student's court for being an artist. And, um, and for some people, that was a real problem. So CalArts had a high attrition rate. And when I was uh, in school there, I, I TA'd for a first year class. And um, a lot of students were upset that we weren't telling them what to do. Um, but then, and, and I think also at that time, uh, you know, in terms of like the finances around college and, and things like that, there was much more financial aid available. And CalArts, Sorry about the siren. Um, still had uh, like a lot of money coming in from the Walt Disney Corporation, yeah. uh, so it allowed them to to uh, live with a high attrition rate. Um, where I where I teach now, like at first I thought when I would start teaching, I thought that I would emulate John Baldessari, but I ended up not doing that uh, in my own teaching. And, and then um, Michael Asher, who uh, Mike Kelly really never worked with and, and um, criticized for, in his mind, being too PC, um, took that whole technique one step further than Baldessari, where he would just walk into the classroom and say, what are we going to talk about today? And then say very little. Sometimes he would punctuate what people were saying with a laugh or something like that. Um, and it's funny because Asher, after a certain point, became wildly popular at CalArts and he would have classes of 40 or 50 students who would um, bring thermoses of coffee and sometimes stay for a marathon session like going to like one or two in the morning. He, and he would stay for as long as the students wanted to be there. But when I studied with him, he was fairly new at CalArts and I was in a class with four other people. <laughs> so, and and uh, one of the women never said a word in class. So there was like a lot of pressure on us to kind of uh, really produce our own discourse. And, but isn't uh, that one of the problems with that model is that it, in, in, in shifting, and it's an important shift in emphasis. I'm not, I'm not against it. I think you know, what, what CalArts does is really significant. But in that shift of 
what are we going to talk about today? Well, the emphasis back on the students. Whose voices get heard in that, or who who is silenced by that approach is also significant. And perhaps that is something one might be critical of today, looking back at, at two. Yeah, that's a good point about the group dynamic. I never, since my group was so small, uh, <laughs> I, I never thought about that so much. Uh, yeah, and, and anytime anyone said something, it was like really a welcome relief. Uh, <laughs> but I can imagine, you know, once the class grew to like 50 or something, um, it, the dynamic would be much different. And, and there were maybe people who, uh, yeah, it, well, it's it's funny. Um, do you guys happen to know uh, the artist Leela Dare, who's a photographer? Um, he um, he recently did a film, uh, or what's the technique that Lee worked with? The the um, oh, just a second. I'm asking my partner a question. Um, What was the tech, the group psychology technique that Lee Ladere was working with? The... Oh. oh, sorry, I, I can't remember. But this um, uh, this this artist Lee Ladere um, did work that was all about. Um, there's a sort of like a psychotherapeutic technique for groups and group dynamics, and. Um, he did a work that was that was all about that, except um, he filmed uh, sessions and then the therapist turned on him because they were saying that the cameras were destroying uh, the therapy. That, that's a kind of offshoot, but it's like an artist who looked at like those very uh, dynamics, not so much in an art class, but in, uh, he did this work in Chicago and it was with a group of people of, Oh, Tavistock method, that's the name of it. Um, and so there were people of, you know, all different ethnic and class backgrounds taking part in this. Um, so the, you know, the differences that, that came out could be sometimes quite sharp, but then, you know, in the therapist's view, Leela Dare's presence with the camera um, was, um, somehow transforming it into something else. And in the course of this, his filming the situation, several of the therapists storm out in anger. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting thing about group dynamics and about uh, documentation. Uh, but um, getting, getting back to educational complex, I think uh, on the, the silences were also, like I, I thought of them as also analogous to moments of transference in psychoanalytic therapy. And then the, the physical holes that Mike Kelly cut um, into the uh, roofs of some of the buildings so you could actually see the floors. Uh, that's another kind of absence that has an interesting uh, connection to Michael Asher's work, which uh, he kind of begrudgingly acknowledges if, um, Actually, one of the best sources, if you want to hear Mike Kelly speak directly about this work, uh, he, um, several of the model builders who worked for him, including Kim Collin, who's now an architect based in London, um, were uh, attending uh, SciArc, so the Southern California Architectural School, and they invited Mike to come for a lecture and was really one of his best lectures ever. And he primarily spoke about educational complex, but he brought up one piece uh, semi facetiously, but one that nonetheless uh, was quite important for him. And it was uh, a work that um, Michael Asher did at the Claire Copley Gallery in Los Angeles, where he removed the wall that was uh, dividing the office space from the exhibition space. So you could see the office in the back of the gallery, which by today's standards is super modest. Like you just see maybe three canvases leaning against the wall, a small table, a telephone and a typewriter. But that was what was exposed by removing, um, by removing this wall. And, uh, and Mike was kind of mocking it like, oh, the big moral revelation. But he, he, he was using, 
his removals in much the same way that Michael Asher did. Oh, you're, you're quiet again, Alex. Sorry, sorry, okay, I'm back here. The number okay. of questions that come through, and I, I'm just gonna read one of them because it seems absolutely pertinent to what we're talking about right now. So, so it's um, um, Beckett Flannery. Um, uh, in a text in his collected essays, he wrote a proposal for a TV show called Zoo TV. In it, purple blobs or goop as a kind of censorship come to stand for repressed censored memories. As the tech goes on, a narrative of alien abduction is revealed as a repressed memory of police CIA abuse. What is the relation of the repressed memory to hierarchies of power? So, uh, so uh, what was this that you were citing again? Um, the, whose, um, whose work was this? It's um, in, in a text of his collective essays, he wrote a proposal for a TV show called Zoo TV. Oh, so I never, never knew of that before. Um, so what is the relationship between repressed, repressed memory? memory to hierarchies of power? And what hierarchies of power are represented within uh, education complex in a sense? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's funny. I think part of Mike's view of repressed memory syndrome was that it was bogus. Yeah. <laughs> but what he liked about it was that it entailed pro projection. And, um, you know, uh, I think you know, in terms of art history, the movement that Mike was most influenced by was surrealism by far. And um, he was actually kind of a scholar of surrealist work and, and um, you know, especially lit literature, but he was, what he liked best about surrealism, uh, carrying over from, you know, European surrealism to the work of William Burroughs uh, was um, the, potential for projection to transform reality effectively. Um, so in a way, I suppose you could say that he had an ambivalent relationship to repressed memory because um, he also really uh, admired Sigmund Freud's work. Repressed memory syndrome is, uh, was an idea that was embraced by you know, a very anti-Freudian camp and uh, you know, it's it's sort of like when um, when Freud goes from seduction theory into the interpretation of dreams, and um, and not taking um, the contents of the analyzans discourse literally. Um, uh, that's that's when um, you know ideas that might be compatible with repressed memory syndrome are rejected. Um, and maybe in that, there, you know, um, there is a power relationship through transference that's another form of projection. Um, and um, the, you know, ability of the analyst to um, uh, interpret interpret dreams or to in, in, interpret the analyzans discourse. And uh, it's funny now, I'm um, forgetting the title of the work that Mike Kelly showed at Metro Pictures at the same time he first showed Educational Complex, but uh, at the time the gallery had like an upper level and then it had a small room in the basement that was, could also be used as an extension. Uh, and Mike was always drawn to basements and subterranean spaces. So he did a work and someone who's tuning in might know the title of it. Um, I forget, um, it's something like we communicate through our shared something or other. Uh, but in it, um, he, uh, he claimed to have collected a uh, work of young children that he taught and in some books, it appears that uh, these drawings actually were by young children. And I've re recently read elsewhere that he actually made the drawings too, but he uh, psychoanalyzed um, these drawings and then made them available. I forget his comments about them on CDs or something like that. But anyway, he was, in a way, he was kind of enacting a certain kind of power relationship. In this case, where like on on the main floor of the gallery, like he's the victim 
uh, of schools. And then in the bottom of the gallery, he's a teacher teaching very young children and superimposing these, um, you know, sort of ludicrous interpretations of their drawings as, you know, usually pulling out some kind of idea of pathology from, uh, you know, what looked like innocent children's drawings. And yeah, I'm not sure if the drawings were real or not. One, one thing that gives me pause is it's actually very hard for a grown up person to mimic a child's drawing convincingly. Um, you know, it seems easy to do, but I think it has to do with cognitive differences. And to me, the drawings looked convincing, but maybe I was fooled. But I wonder, uh, that, that does seem <laughs> an important question again, coming back to this work, that question of belief, what we believe, what's true and what's not true, especially when we think about projection, where, where in a sense, the, ab the, 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 the absolute truth of it is a nonsense. In, 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 the, in projection, we project it, therefore it becomes true. And something, something of that seems really important in this. Also, in, a, in, in the um, repressed memory, that there is that there is a perhaps a, a, a problematic notion there of a sort of um, a center of something, or the start of something, the thing that is the cause of the way we are now, the, the, that we manifest these these distress signals now because of something that is that is you know at the, at the center of this hole that can't be discovered, and, yeah. and something about the truth seems to me really important in the work, and, in, and a critique of that seems important. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because um, one of the th things that Mike always maintained was that art is a belief structure primarily. And then um, when I wrote my short text for this event, you know, it was just uh, right as uh, the COVID pandemic was hitting New York really hard. And um, it made me realize that how the value of what I was doing, you know, both my artwork and my teaching and, and my criticism, uh, in a way, were all up for grabs. And, um, and you know, it made me think of, of like the overarching financial system too, that, um, you know, money has value because we all agree that it does. And if we were to say like, oh, this money, it's just a round piece of metal that doesn't mean anything, you know, um, then it would have no value, you know? So it's, 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 it has value because we all agree to use it as a medium of exchange. And, um, you know, it, it's funny, even though uh, the conditions of the pandemic, especially in the U S are, are still raging, things seem to have stabilized a bit, but, uh, those first few weeks, um, there was a lot of, um, I felt a lot of questions about like, oh, what is a, what is a stable institution? And, uh, uh, you know, and if uh, people's priorities change, uh, you know, what will become of the institution? And, you know, one of the obvious ones in terms of teaching uh, is, um, will students be able and will they want to continue their educations, you know? and uh, and I, I think that's, you know, a lot of students are evaluating that right now. Um, so anyway, that, that made all, all those questions very vivid uh, in relationship to Mike's work. And, and then um, I had mentioned this to you before when uh, we spoke briefly, but, um, you know, it seemed that he battened on to the whole McMartin preschool case because it was preposterous and, and he liked the kind of outlandishness. And, uh, and at one point in, in, um, in writing about this work, Howard Singerman said, like some of the testimony from some of the children sounded as though it had been scripted by Mike Kelly, um, you know, because they were questioning these children. And I think the children could sense that the prosecutors wanted vivid stuff. And, and I could also imagine that some of the children didn't want to be grilled for that long. So they would provide them, you know, they would sense what the questioner wanted and then uh, make up what they wanted to hear to bring it to the end. So there were, you know, uh, ideas about 
you know, orgies going on in car washes and trips and hot air balloons and um, things like that. But then, you know, just within this last year, the whole Jeffrey Epstein uh, sexual abuse ring came to the forefront and it's almost as fantastic as any of the allegations that, you know, maybe save the hot air balloon, <laughs> yeah. anything that came up in McMartin. So um, it's the reverse, isn't it, in a way? Because on the one yeah. hand, where you have the set of constructed truths where children are being encouraged to find what perhaps is or isn't there. And in the other version, you have a set of truths that have been not allowed to be spoken until much more recently, that have been kept in a hole and, and you know, forcibly not, it's, it's not that they weren't remembered, they were very much remembered, but they, they weren't spoken, it wasn't possible to speak. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think part of it, you know, part of it certainly has to do with social class and privilege and, you know, having the wherewithal to suppress that or to, you know, have political influence with a, a jury or a judge uh, or a politician. Uh, but then part of it, I think, also had to do with the climate where, um, you know, if a young woman came forth with the allegation of rape, um, you know, shame was heaped upon her. And, and, uh, and, you know, that's something that I think has changed uh, significantly. Uh, I think it's still a difficult thing to do, but it's not uh, such an inconceivable thing to do as it, you know, once may have been. Absolutely. Um, I'm just reminding you that this might be a good moment in which to show the video you wanted to show, actually, because it, 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 it does seem to comment on a lot of what we've been talking about, simply in terms of teaching. It'd be very good to perhaps play this now as a, as a transition into maybe opening up the discussion to, to our audience. Okay. Yeah, so the work I'm going to show, it's a collaborative work, and um, I've collaborated uh, with an artist in Japan, uh, Takuji Kogo, uh, for hard to believe, but it's almost 20 years, I think. Um, and um, we started working by taking the texts of personal ads and uh, turning them into songs using uh, text-to-voice software. And then after a certain point, um, personal ads no longer seem to be a very much kind of living category the way they once were. It, um, I mean, I'm sure they're still out there, but it's uh, there's been a cultural shift, I think. So we started working with um, texts and works by other artists and doing cartoon versions of them. And then I thought uh, that I should do an auto interview uh, about teaching. So we made this piece called uh, Reproducing Relations of Production, a kind of Marxist title. Uh, so I'll go into screen share and, oh, won't do that yet. First I have to get the right page up. Okay. So we tested this earlier and it took us a bit of time to get it sorted, but we're pretty confident now that we are technologically able to. Uh, <laughs> okay, now I'll screen share again. There it is. And I will start it. Um, okay, here goes. What do you do? I'm an artist. I teach art at a college. At a women's college, and I'm allergic to the perfumes that go into soap. What is the best? Well, a student goes on to become successful. How do you measure that? It's hard to measure it. In. 
depends on the person. But if we become more successful than you, that might be good. Why do you say my? Because if all your students are better than you, that means you are a bad artist. That leaves you are a bad teacher. How do you teach art? Art can be taught. What about teaching technique? You can teach skills, but that's different. Do you want your students to make her like girls? No, that's the old fashioned model. It's counter productive. What do you want? I want students to be themselves. Isn't that a trap? Of course, but what's the alternative? If it's an apparatus, function of your group forms under the aegis of the institution. The students learn more from each other than from anyone else. But without the institution, there would be no peer group. students we had no grades also all of the faculty were having affairs with students now there are grades and no affairs but how do you grade i grade on effort i don't believe in talent also i don't tell students what to do sometimes they really hate that do you it can lead to bad evaluations if you get bad student evaluations. You might not get a raise or you might lose your position. Oh, buffering. <laughs> A vicious circle. Teachers tend to give higher grades to get better student evaluations. That leads to great inflation. If grades get too high for those who it can lose its accreditation. The administration really fears that. Yes, and no, sometimes I fantasize about the delegation. Allow you no grades, no diplomas, no tuition. Tuition has become so high in the U.S. A lot of students assume they bought a diploma teaching in turn becomes a service industry. The old model of the autonomous intellectual is gone. Isn't this a question of legitimation? Yes, but 
object in the sea, the first value. Perhaps everything's in jazz. I love the you believe art has a use value. That's fantastic. <laughs> Completely. <Thank you. laughs> It's the nail on my head in so many slightly alarming ways. It's fabulous. Well, well, oh, I think it's still going. Let me uh, just get rid of this. Sorry. Um, going into the next song there. Autoplay. <laughs> um, so th there have been a number of questions that come through. I think it might be a good chance to get our audience involved at this point. So okay. there's... Um, I mean, first of all, just um, uh, from Shun, I think most people in the UK higher education would agree with that statement. Um, mm -hmm. um, I don't know which of the statements, one of, one of the statements in, in, the, in the film. And then oh. Nick Finch is asking, does repressed a memory syndrome perhaps relate to Halter's idea of obviousness uh, in his ideological state apparatuses uh, in Kelly's example here? So Althusser and Kelly, perhaps a link in terms of in terms of the, his idea of obviousness in ideological state apparatuses. Uh, I, I think so. Yes, uh, and and um, and also you know the the holes where um, you know we conventionally think of you know, subjectivity flowing from a centered individual, and uh, and Althusser argues that. Uh, you know, we're at our most ideological when we believe, like, I am who I am, and uh, my beliefs are who I am. And uh, so, you know, that's the kind of, like, absence that's uh, kind of, um, I don't know if volatile is the right word, but operative or something like that. Yeah. Um, We've got another question from... Beckett Flannery. Beckett, would you like me to, uh, I'm, I've allowed you to talk, would you like to ask a question directly or I'm happy to read it out? I'll just read it. Um, no, he's still muted, um, so he can't talk oh. yet. You have to grant him the... I just thought I just did that. Okay. Yeah, Ooh. okay. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry, yeah. No. yeah we can. Um, so I, I had just already asked the question about uh, Zoo TV and um, that essay. Mm -hmm. uh, in relationship to police and CIA abuse, but I also was curious why Kelly included his family home in the model. Uh, I I think is like the first uh, site of being educated, uh, and you know it's funny now with the pandemic, like there's a lot of homeschooling going on. But even you know before you enter into uh, a school, school you're 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 learning from your parents, and then maybe what intensified that uh, for Mike was that his father was a high school janitor. Uh, so um, I, as a child, he sometimes actually went to work with his father, um, you know, and, and just went to these different parts of the school that you would never see, like the, the basements, the looking at the infrastructure, you know, as he went about his business. Um, so I, I think he traces all that back to back to his home, and uh, and and but it was the home was like a kind of um, last minute decision. Like he had he had mapped out all the other schools and then decided to put his home in, and then uh, I think that that then became the precursor for his last work, Mobile Homestead, which um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's um, it's a work he did in, in Detroit. Originally, he wanted to purchase the, the house he grew up in and turn that into an artwork, but the people living there didn't want to sell. Um, so he made a, um, a complete reconstruction. At least it looks exactly the same from the outside. On the inside, um, uh, it may be different and it's, uh, and it was designed to move. And um, when the, the piece premiered at the Museum of Contemporary Art in, in Detroit, 
the idea was they were taking it um, as you would like a double wide trailer, like a mobile home. Um, they were taking it to Henry Ford's Greenfield Village. Uh, and uh, that's like a kind of Americana sort of amusement park that Henry Ford made that includes an architectural collection of houses and buildings that pertain to famous figures in American history, like Thomas Ed Edison's workshop and things like that. So in a way, Mike Kelly wanted to like encroach on that as, you know, so casting himself as an important figure in this pantheon that Henry Ford uh, had put together architecturally. Um, but as it turned out that the, the uh, trailer that was transporting the uh, mobile homestead got a flat tire, so it never made it to Greenfield Village. And uh, it, even though it, it can be moved, I think it remains pretty much parked outside the museum. But then there's a significant other part of the work, which is the basement that is just built there on site. And, um, and I hadn't seen that discussed anywhere until I uh, went to Detroit and um, got to see the work. And luckily the head of the Kelly Foundation was there, Mary Claire Stevens, and she was doing a kind of condition report on this work and let me go into the basement. And I had to sign a waiver uh, and at first it seemed melodramatic, but what he did for the basement was like a kind of underground labyrinth where you had to like squeeze through holes and go up and down ladders. And from the standpoint of insurance, I'm sure it, it's a nightmare for the museum. Uh, but that's the other part, the non-mobile part of mobile homestead. Um, and anyway. I mean, it's very interesting what you say in terms of homeschooling there and the relationship to homeschooling. Partly because yeah. certainly in this country, we've seen a massive increase in interest in homeschooling, where one might have thought that actually, certainly my experience of homeschooling is that I never want to see my children ever again, let alone actually school them from home. But somehow it's had the opposite effect in the country, which, which suggests a sort of dissatisfaction with, with, with educational institutions, that, that the need to take it home might be something that, that people feel very um, in yeah. need of. Yeah, in the, in the US, people who homeschool their children tend to be either, um, you know, from some kind of alternative kind of countercultural background or fundamentalist Christians, which you could say that's a counterculture too, I suppose. <laughs> um, Here you might also add to that the very wealthy where homeschooling doesn't mean you school them, it just means somebody else school them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, there's that too, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Amber, I, you're muted. Sorry. No. Um, if there are, for well, for the for the students in the room, uh, if you have comments, not just questions, you know, maybe about your desires and motivations in relation to what John said about how students, how you how you feel about the continuing your education, do feel free to comment as well as ask questions. In this and also in future art school Q and A's. One of the things that interested me, John, was that you said earlier on that you, um, that initially when you got into teaching, you'd, you'd felt you might emulate the Baldessari model, but actually once you started, you, just, you very quickly decided that was not the model you were going to work with. What becomes your model in a sense, or what, what, where, where, does your, where does your teaching take you in that kind of journey? It's funny, I, I don't have like such a clear model as my CalArts teachers did, and uh, Part of the reason is where I've, where I've been for the last 20 years at Barnard College, it's, uh, it, it doesn't function so much as an art school per se. What we have is a, a visual arts concentration that's part of an art history department. So all of our majors are art history majors. And instead of doing a written thesis, they do a studio thesis. And we don't teach from the presumption that they want to become artists necessarily. And just if we look at where they've gone after graduation, uh, 
what we have demographically is just that um, they go into a wide range of um, professions, um, not so much scientific, more liberal arts professions, but sometimes medicine, but not, not like scientific research. But uh, we have a high percentage of students who go on to get advanced degrees. Um, so um, it's a, so there's, there's different goals. And then also in my classes, sometimes I have students uh, who's, you know, one semester in my photography class will be the only art class that they've ever taken. And they often see that as a kind of relief uh, or, you know, like a chance to do something fun as opposed to their academic work. So, <laughs> so there's like a whole different set of expectations oftentimes that, that they come to school with that differ very much from what mine were. Um, we have a comment, I think, from Shun in the audience, if you'd like to. Hi. Yeah. Um, hi, this is for all the panelists, because I assume that all of you are involved with like um, arts higher education. But I think one thing that the, the pandemic has really shown, and you talked about this in your essay, um, John, was you know, the current model of an art school, of an institution is really coming under attack. Um, yes and it's really being exposed by the pandemic and just, you know, the just the amount of capital required to keep funding this programs results in like high student intakes and, and um, you know, higher fees and just institutions are not able to really adapt quickly enough, I think, to, to cater to such diverse, to a much more diverse student body. I'm just wondering, you know, as, as people involved in the, the higher education of the arts, how do you see, um, you know, arts education continuing or is, is it just like a move towards decentralization or, because I don't think that the current model of people attending art schools and then, you know, going, being marketed um, a certain dream of what the art school will provide, or like what this commodity will provide is really um, holding up anymore. Well, uh, one, th one thing I can say is it's, um, you know, thinking back to the 1970s, late 1970s, when I was in graduate school, um, it's uh, obviously a much different world now than it was then. But um, the idea of um, almost none of us had the expectation that we would make a living on the basis of our education or training as artists. And um, at, at the t when I got out of school, uh, the youngest artists that were being shown were conceptual artists, like first generation conceptualists. And then after that, there was like a steep drop off. And um, but at the same time, there was like this kind of burgeoning, what was then called an alternative space movement. Uh, so that was seen as, in an idealistic way as a kind of alternative to the gallery system. But then really what they functioned as, as time went on was a feeder system. But that's where younger artists tended to show. And, um, you know, in the 80s, 90s and 2000s, the art world kept expanding. And with it came, you know, careers and all aspects of it. And I, I think now I expect it to shrink. Um, whether, I don't think it's gonna shrink back to like 1970s levels when, when the art world was really small because now it's globalized. Um, I do think, and it's probably like a bigger issue in the US than anywhere else where tuitions are, are so high and, um, and that's butting up against this ideology that the state should not cover tuition. Um, that's really deeply rooted in American culture, but there's, um, you know, there's a growing movement to change that. And, you know, part of um, uh, 
Bernie Sanders' agenda was to address tuition. And, you know, he characterized himself as a socialist, but really that would re really fall in line with like European centrist politics. Uh, but in, in relative terms in the US that's seen as like a far left proposition. And I, in not just talking about art education, but just talking about education in general, um, you know, it's one of the criticisms that um, Thomas Piketty raised in his book, Capitalism in the 21st Century, where he saw that, um, you know, the solution to income inequality was more access to higher education. And, um, and, and he's uh, explicitly identified the U.S. as being like the worst case for that in terms of like a social, social hierarchy. So um, I think that these pressures are coming to a head. Um, and, um, you know, right now I'm speaking to you from Berlin. It's much different here. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially in terms of education where uh, I think in, the, in most of continental Europe, if you accept it into a school, you just need to cover your room and board. Uh, so uh, students don't come out with the kind of massive amounts of debt that they do in the US. Um, and increasingly and in the UK, unfortunately, where there's a, a, a model of loans from the university, from the government that you are then obliged to pay back. Uh, yeah. When um, I mean, certainly, I, I, I won't take up much time on this, this is not for me to uh, overstate my presence, but just to say that in terms of what Shun asked earlier, I think one of the things that is interesting is that this is undoubtedly the current situation is making us ask very fundamental questions about uh, the nature, not just of art schools, but the nature of education. One of the questions I think that we have to consider is the relationship between art school and the university sector. Uh, and that's something that I think is up for grabs suddenly. Um, and certainly in terms of a decentralized model that you hinted at, I think that is something that potentially is, is, is important and where change could be positive. I think it's, there, are, there are lots of things that, are, that are, have been questioned quite rightly, that have been problematized quite rightly, but I think some of the changes being asked for could end up being positive change if we, if we take the opportunities at their word and really try and work with them. Um, but I guess it's all to see, but uh, it's certainly, you know, Things are, are not stable at the moment. Things are up for grabs. There's, there's a sort of change in the air that's really required and want to be needed. And I think that could throw up all sorts of interesting questions. But in terms of art schools, what is their relationship to universities? I think to me really matters as a question. Yeah. And an, uh, another facet of this too, Yeah, you know, I, I wrote my text before the uh, killing of George Floyd and before um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, showed this strong resurgence in response. Um, and um, you know, I think immediately they were focusing on um, police brutality and police killings, but I would expect their program uh, to expand to demands for education too and more, because I, I think that that's structurally transformative and, um, and that's where change needs to be made. So I've got, I've got one question that's come through from a member of staff on the art programme, because it so happens that before this conversation started, we'd met as a, as a team and we were talking perhaps about the, the problematics of our history within art school and how, how, in a sense, our history is no longer taught in that conventional sense within art school. But perhaps to throw, throw that question at, um, at you, John, what do you think it might be the relationship? What might new art histories within a notion of art school be and how might that be constituted? Is that something that, 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 that you have to think about in your own department? Well, um, you know, since all my students are art history majors, um, oftentimes their grasp of art history is, is better than mine because they're studying with top art historians. And, uh, and uh, as it turns out, my daughter is becoming a 19th century art historian. Um, and I'm terrible with dates. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's, that's not the crux of it, but, um, but, you know, one 
debate that's alive right now is in art history, and it's almost like a classic postmodernist question, is, is the axis of chronology versus geography. And, and so how are different art historical studies categorized? Like, uh, you know, we speak of medieval art, but then Chinese art becomes a, a geographical designation that's outside a, a chronological um, categorization. So uh, in a way, art historians are struggling to reconcile, like, you know, uh, our chronological orientation tends to reproduce a Eurocentric uh, <laughs> notion of art history. And then, you know, everything else is other and, and, and uh, geographically described. So um, it's something that, at least at Barnard College, many of the art historians are aware of. There's not an easy solution, but there's a sense that these, uh, these categories are charged and, and, uh, and um, kind of laden with ideological implications. Uh, and then also um, something that's been gradually coming to the fore in the US is uh, just an awareness of South American and Latin American art that's, um, you know, there's still like much research and much writing that needs to be done on that subject. Um, so that's, those are two things that are in the air uh, in my department. Um, that's really helpful, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to keep everyone for too long. And I think it's been a very rich and complex discussion again. So I'm, perhaps we should stop here. Um, but thank you so much, John, for joining us and for contributing your essay and Alex for hosting. Um, uh, the next art school event will be next Monday at the same time. Um, and hopefully we can continue some of the conversations we've been having then. Well, thank you for inviting me and, and thanks for all of you uh, tuned into this. Um, I you know, appreciate your interest in what I have to say and uh, good luck with the rest of the series. Thanks so much. All right, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Sounds great. Bye, Alex. Bye,